Every idea, every story starts with a spark, a tiny light that glows. But to speak up, to be heard, to innovate takes courage. We're here to ignite that tiny spark. We're here to foster Canadian voices, our narratives, our ideas. We're here to spark courage. Our logo is a showcase for our culture, our storytellers, our innovators, and it reflects our creators and communities. The spark is a catalyst to push boundaries, to drive the future, and for Canadian voices to be heard on a global stage. Great story starts with a new beginning. You're a wizard, Harry. Welcome, Julia Child. The origin story. The next Food Network star is Guy. For decades, Warner Media and Discovery have imagined new possibilities. There's nothing in the world more powerful than a good story. Now, we start a new chapter, together. With superheroes. All of life is about growing to greatness. Protect the natural world. Monsters. Okay. Here's Johnny. Myths. <laughs> and legends. I want that, man. What's up, Doc? Sidekicks. I shall call him Mini Me. And damsels in distress. I have never, ever been happier. You're a witch. I will destroy you in ways that are so creative, they will honor me for it at the Kennedy Center. We have to think of the future now. Today, we dream bigger. We're beginning with breaking news. Dream brighter. I'm ready to fly. Dream together. We dream of all the stories yet to be told. Welcome to Warner Brothers Discovery, the stuff that dreams are made of. Hello everyone and welcome to the 2022 Future of Film Showcase presented by Cineplex Entertainment and CBC Gem. My name is Jocelyn Lau and I'm the Chief Operating Officer this year. 
On behalf of the FOFS team, we sincerely thank you for joining us today. FOFS is proud to recognize our public funders, Telefilm Canada, the Arts Best Business and Arts Program, and the Government of Canada. Today, we're pleased to present our closing keynote conversation with Jim Cummings, moderated by Deepa Prashad. Our Director of Accessibility, Carmel Pichero, will be with us for providing ASL interpretation. Closed captioning is made available as well. This conversation, along with a full list of our industry program and film schedule, are available to view on fofs.ca. And our official selection is streaming on CBC GEM. Thank you for being with us here today. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Jim Cummings and Deepa Prashad. Thank you so much, Jocelyn, for that introduction. So like Jocelyn said, hi, hello, my name is Deepa Prashad. I'm a TV and radio host here in Toronto. And a huge, huge thank you goes out to the Future of Film Showcase for having myself and Jim Cummings here. And I, I'm gonna add, I might have another special guest because my cat's walking around. <laughs> so if you see paws, if you see a tail or you hear a meow, it's not me, it's my cat. So I just wanted to get that out there. Jim, welcome, how are you? Thank you for having me. A more special guest. Uh, what, the cat, than you? Of course, of course. Of course. <laughs> no, 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 not at all. You're the special guest of today. And again, um, you know, this film festival is so important because it, it really is meant to support emerging filmmakers in the Canadian industry. And of course, you are one of the filmmakers that so many young and uh, new filmmakers look up to. So there's always a story that starts everything and every career, every journey. So, um, you know, was there a particular movie or movies that you watched when you were growing up and you were like, you know what, I think I need to make movies. Was that a situation that you had? Yeah, I mean, there were, there were many, but I think there were like three really contributive ones at different stages of my life. So I saw The Matrix when I was a kid, I must have been 12 or something. Yeah. <laughs> and that was just so awesome. And I was like, oh, you can make you can make cool Kung Fu movies. And like the, all of the cinema that went into that really made me fall in love with movies. Um, and then I saw Children of Men in theaters a whole lot of times when it came out in 2007 in the States. And that was something where it was like a fusion of my film school education and popular kind of blockbuster aesthetic. So it was like all the things that I loved about Itzumama Matambien and like, you know, the Tarkovsky movies of long takes and humanist filmmaking kind of as a Trojan horse was this like action movie as well. And I was like, oh, you could do something cool. Yeah, that, was, that was pretty neat. And then I saw a film at South by Southwest in 2015 called Cretia. Trey Edward Schultz's first movie and it's shot in a backyard for nothing but it was this kind of family drama and that was the movie that made me realize that you can make movies in your house and uh, with your friends and family and bully them into being in a movie and play <laughs> on the world stage and so those three movies I think are probably the most contributive ones to me and where I am now. You know what's interesting is especially that last film that you talked about is filming movies at home with your family and your friends. That's kind of the situation that we're in now with COVID. Yeah. So it's funny that that is actually what it inspired you most. And, you know, in, in this industry, I find that every single person's journey is completely different and unique. So, you know, when you started in this industry, was it linear? Like you had a set plan, you executed everything and you got to where you wanted and needed to be, or was it a completely non-linear path for you? Mine was really non-linear. I know like there are people who set out to do the thing and then they end up having their dreams come true, but mine was not like that at all. There were many, you know, faults and starts. And um, I, I started out as a writing and directing major at Emerson College. And I thought that when I graduated, somebody was going to hire a 21-year-old to direct a big TV show or something. Um, and then realized that that was not true. And I was not, I did not have the credentials to be able to do that. And so I was a producer for six years after graduating for friends of mine who were very talented, who were making smaller animations and music videos. And I just thought, I'm good on the phone. I can probably do this as a living. Yeah. And I uh, spent six years doing that and then became very dissatisfied with not having the reins myself and just saw nothing but missed opportunities and the stuff that I was doing. It wasn't really that funny and it wasn't really that important. And then I made a short film that I acted in. I'm not an actor. I like have never taken an acting class, but I knew that I, I knew what good acting looked like. And so 
this one day I bullied my friends to come and be the cast and crew for a short film called Thunder Road. That was just this weird performance art piece where I play a cop at a funeral and uh, we submitted it to Sundance on a whim. It's quite good, uh, but it got in and then it won. And then that was probably 10 years into my filmmaking life. Uh, and that was the first real big gold strike. Uh, and it, it took a long time and then it happened all at once. So really very roundabout way to becoming a writer, actor and director and very roundabout way to have people who are young see my movies in the first place. It's crazy. Yeah, and I think it's important to note too that like you might have a set plan, a set goal, but life takes you in different directions. You have different experiences, but you know, it leads to something great in the end. And you mentioned something interesting with Thunder Road. Um, you know, you said that you had submitted it to the Sundance Film Festival, but when you're in the process of making those movies, are you like, you know what, I want to make a movie that's going to be award-winning or are you just like I'm making things for fun and if people like it they like it if they don't they don't yeah it's a, now I've grown into that now I've become a lot more mature when it was 2015 that I made the Thunder Road short and I was so ambitious and I was so petty and I just wanted to make something <laughs> better than what was you know that my friends were making it was yeah. just kind of like sibling rivalry and I was like all right well my buddy Danny is making something and that got into South by Southwest I can't let him win I'm gonna <laughs> all of this like serious pettiness that got me off the couch to make stuff. Um, so, so really in the beginning, I knew because I had been to South by Southwest and I had seen the film that they programmed on Short of the Week. On Short of the Week, there's a channel that I don't know how many people know about, but you can watch films that have screened at all these different film festivals and you don't need to buy the tickets to get there. So it's like oh, cool. all of the films that are um, that, it, that release online you can see for free. And it, and it became this education for me. And you know, nine out of the 10 are amazing and it's cool stuff from around the world. And then one of them is fine. And so I was like, I could probably do, if I, I just have to be better than this one to get into the festival. <laughs> And so I had a good education in that sense where I knew what was culturally and socially significant. But at best, I thought, you know, maybe Vimeo will staff pick this thing and it could be a funny viral video of a cop dancing at a funeral. Um, I never dreamed that we'd be where we are now. And um, I think that's a good thing. Yeah, and I think you need to be pushed in certain aspects, right? Like, I know you're saying you're a bit petty. <laughs> you're like, yeah. I want to do better than my friends, but sometimes yeah. that pushes you in the right direction. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And, and like, <laughs> but what were your friends' response to that? I'm kind of curious. Like, was it a battle? Like, oh, my film did this. And then your friends are like, we can do better. Like, how did Absolutely. that work out? Oh, I, I think that's the, that is the structure of our company. I think that's how we end up making anything is these petty jealousies and sibling rivalries. <laughs> um, I hate to say it, but like, you know, George Lucas and Steven Spielberg and Robert Zemeckis, I'm sure we're all the same. Like, you know, Joe Dante, I'm sure like that whole crowd of a graduating class from that school, we're all the same. I, I think that that's helpful. It's like a, a really good competitive environment where, you know, we're all friends, but also, you know, my movie's better than theirs. And I'm <laughs> sure that they'll say the same thing. <laughs> we're getting the hardcore truth today. <laughs> <the gym comments. laughs> but it's, I mean, I think it's a fair statement to be like, yeah, that's yeah. the real deal. Why we do a lot of the projects that we get involved with, but I think it's also important to note that, especially for young filmmakers or graduates or anything like that, it's like when you first come into the industry, it might not be exactly what you pictured or imagined it to be. So were there any specific roadblocks that you remember facing oh, yeah. when, when you first came into the industry? All of them. I mean, yeah, like, you know, when we got, when we came into the film industry, it would have been 2009 when I graduated from Emerson. And the two biggest problems were financing and distribution. It was mm -hmm. impossible to get a film financed. It was impossible to get distribution for it. And we've kind of solved both of those through crowd equity financing, uh, which is great. It's like Kickstarter, except the backers own percentages of the film, which is awesome and has been very, you know, an interesting way for people to be able to make movies like startups. Um, and then distribution, we found, we self-distributed the feature of Thunder Road and kind of cracked that code with the Sundance Institute of how anybody can do it and follow in our footsteps. Um, so yeah, I mean, there's a thousand different things that are huge obstacles for anybody. Anybody who's listening to this, I'm sure is certain of this because it's so miserable making movies 
independently. You feel like nobody's going to help you. You feel like nobody's going to see the thing and you really care about it with your whole heart. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we got met with every obstacle and only by running at it head first did we really um, solve any of the problems. And I hope people can look at what we've done and not have to go through that same stupid stuff that we did. Yeah, and you mentioned like really big issues that you had to face, funding and distribution. And in that time that you were like, oh my goodness, how do we get through this? Was there ever a moment in your head where you're like, you know what? this is not necessarily what I could be doing with my life. I want to try something else. And if you ever had that moment, what got you back into like, you know what, as hard as it is, I am sticking to this a hundred percent. I had that moment yesterday. I mean, I had what? that last week. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. We're, we're yeah. going out, we're going out with um, screenplays that I spend years of my life writing and I have a closet full of trophies and, and all, great scoreboards on our Rotten Tomatoes pages for all of the three features that I've made so far. And still yeah. people don't trust our decision-making faculties. Still people say, you know, well, we think that this could, we can't see how this can be a movie. I'll record my scripts as podcast and send it to them with music. They can listen to the movie beforehand. And even then we can't get financing. It's, um, and it's not even expensive movies. Like to try and get the funding for Thunder Road, it was 200 grand. It was 190 grand American. Yeah. And, and we couldn't get the financing to do that. We had to go through Kickstarter. And even now with where we are, you know, I thought we'd reached the mountaintop of being able to do stuff and it's just not true. I think the, the, the trophies and everything aren't really good for that much and everybody wants to make their own stuff. You kind of have to be the one to, to do it on your own. I think that's just the way, the nature of the market, you know, 99 times out of a hundred, if you want to make an independent film, the one that survives is the one where the person says, all right, I'm going to produce it myself. Mm -hmm. So yeah, battling the serious depression that is being an independent filmmaker, um, it, really the thing that gets me back on track is watching a great movie. Like I saw Seven Samurai on 35 millimeter at the Los Feliz 3 not too long ago, and it's the perfect movie. And to see something where it's very funny and also very poignant and tragic and to have the entire audience laugh, you know, 80 years after the movie came out was really beautiful and touching and a reminder that um, we're doing this not for the money or for the acclaim, but to be part of the tapestry of cinema. Yeah, and that's the thing with film in specific is universal, right? Something that, like you said, 80 years ago is relevant now and still evokes yeah. emotions on a completely different level for people. So, I mean, I guess like you're, in terms of your experience, your track record doesn't necessarily mean, you know, I got three things in the can, but it's going to be a success from here, right? So yeah. in terms of, especially with COVID, I feel like that must have been a very difficult time to navigate through. So what's next beyond that? You know, like you've, you've recorded your scripts, sent them as podcasts with music, but if that doesn't work, what are the other steps you have to take to ensure that your project is successful? You just gotta make the movie. Yeah, you like produce it on movie. your own. Yeah, you can't, yeah, you can't not make movies. You, you cannot not work. I mean, I would go, I'd go nuts. I, like if, if I had to sit on my hands my whole life and not be able to tell stories, I'd lose my mind. And so you have to keep doing. Um, it's in my DNA, it feels like. Um, so I don't know, with COVID, I feel really bad for the next generation of people because I learned so much from learning and leaning over someone else's shoulder while they were editing something. And I go, oh, I didn't know you could do that. And just the proximity issues of having a friend group that were all making things. Um, YouTube tutorials are very helpful and I've learned a lot doing that same thing. But um, the kind of communal endurance of making a small budget movie is just rarer nowadays with COVID. It's, it costs more to gather a group of people because of testing. Um, and so it's just, it's more difficult to make something like Dogtooth than I thought it would be. And mm -hmm. I thought that that kind of filmmaking, Cresha and Dogtooth were gonna be, you know, this generation's um, bread and butter, that you'd be able to make stuff that is a chamber piece or a horror film that all takes place in one spot. And I haven't seen that come to fruition yet. Yeah, and it's just interesting that as time goes, the challenges become totally different and you just have to come up with new ways and new motivation to really stick with it. And I know you mentioned Emerson, that's where you graduated from. So in today's landscape, do you think that it is 
absolutely essential to go to film school or like a film institute to become a successful filmmaker. You're already nodding your head. You're like, no, Deepa, not I, at all. <laughs> I almost swore. I almost said no, um, but no, of course not. Trey, Trey Schultz, before he made Krisha, had a library card, didn't go to film school. And he got a DVD of Dogtooth. And he was like, oh, you can make a movie in one location that's terrifying as long as you focus on the cinema. And uh, and that became his film school education was watching movies that played in Cannes and stuff. Um, so no, I don't think that that's necessary at all. I mean, like I have a projector screen in the Criterion channel and my film education was not necessarily Emerson. It was going to Blockbuster and turning my head sideways and looking at the labels for the Criterion Collection movies and digging through the crates and trying to find DVDs for old movies. Um, it's so much easier now. I think the, the main issue is, uh, you know, the community aspect of it, of having a group of friends that come together that can all inspire each other and learn from each other. That's the, that's what education is. Mm -hmm. And then as much as time as you're spending communally in the laboratory, you also have to spend time in the library uh, studying. And, you know, I learned almost everything I know about movies just from being on set and making stuff. And, you know, rolling cables for other people. I don't know how often that is possible nowadays with COVID. So yeah, I, I, I really do spend a decent amount of my time trying to help the next generation because those opportunities that were there for me in 2019, you know, in 2009 are, are not always there. Mm -hmm. But I, I think everything you said has truth to it. It's like a lot of experience watching all these movies, setting it that way, working on sets, rolling cable. But for, for anyone who is in film school right now, <laughs> what were some of the positive takeaways that you had from your schooling and that educational experience? Just people. I mean, there are people that I still work with. Danny Madden, my good buddy who graduated with me, um, is coming over tomorrow night to watch the um, uh, Love, Death, and Robots, the David Fincher <laughs> show. And we, we haven't seen the new season, so we're going to save the time and watch the new season. I, I've known that guy for 18 years now. I've known him for half my life because we met freshman year of, of college. And it's he's a Sundance filmmaker. He's like, a you know, the Daniels also graduated with us, the guys that made Everything Everywhere All at Once and oh, uh, yeah. Swiss mm -hmm. Army Man. So like, there is this wonderful community that I took from film school. Um, Issa Rae said that. She said, uh, network across, not up. And that's so important. And if you can go to film festivals and rub shoulders with people uh, and make movies together or encourage each other, that is often a much better way to grow inside of an industry than you know, trying to work your way up a ladder. Eventually, just the way that time works, I'm going to retire and one of y'all is gonna to have to take my position and you will have known a thousand people who are friends of yours that are your age and that's just the nature of generational shifts. It's just the nature of, of time. So it's important to make friends and it's important to help others. And with that networking and schooling, that's also the basis of friendly competition that, um, you know. Jealousy. It is the basis of jealousy, <laughs> yeah. And I know to a lot of, um, you know, young and emerging filmmakers, you are a huge inspiration to them, especially through films like Thunder Road, because you were working with lower budgets and like fewer resources in comparison to these massive Hollywood productions that we are like very, very used to. So in a situation like that, would you say that character development and stories and the storytelling of it is more important or the most important to flesh out? Um, character development I'm bad at. I think uh, one of my favorite movies of the last few years was Uncut Gems and he doesn't change at all. And mm -hmm. I think that's so funny. He's just this like constant force and it's a cautionary tale. I don't think you need to have necessarily character development in uh, in a film. Story is incredibly important mm -hmm. and craftsmanship is incredibly important. Using the camera and the sound and the music to help tell the story is everything. Um, when we were making movies in the beginning, we were in competition with movies that we had no business being in competition with, where it was just kind of over the shoulder, you know, improv comedy coverage, simple, no cinema, more like sketch comedy stuff. And we would eat their lunch every day because we were based in the tradition of, of cinematic language rather than sketch comedy language. Um, we made better movies in that sense. So I think that story is very important. I think that showing people what they can't see in a movie theater or on television is incredibly important. Making something subversive and making something, if you don't have money, 
where the audience can go, I can't believe they did that. Mm -hmm. That is such a great place to tell, to put an audience because cinema goers want to see something that is incredibly uh, uncomfortable or like um, rare and impressive. And you can do that for not much money. You know, Thunder Road is a single location short film. It's a guy having a nervous breakdown uh, during a eulogy, which is very funny. And I think it was all form fit to make an audience laugh and make an audience cry and shock them where they leave the cinema going, you got, you can't believe this thing, what they did. It, it's more like vaudeville or like a circus act because you're not gonna compete with the VFX of Marvel. You're not gonna compete with that. You need to make something very subversive um, and something that they can't see anywhere else. And I think that's kind of our niche and it's done, it's done well for us. Yeah, and you bring up an interesting point is like you want audiences to leave and be like, whoa, like how did they do that? What did I just watch? Hey. But I feel like in the film industry, the movie industry, it's very common that once you have a big celebrity attached with like, oh my God, Tom Cruise is in this movie, then that might actually be a massive factor to attracting audiences. So let's say that you don't have that on your side. You can't say like this person is starring in this movie. What are the other steps that you are taking to attract audiences? Yeah, I mean, I've never really had that. Robert Forrester and Ricky Lindholm and Jimmy Tatro are in my second movie, Wolf of Snow Hollow, and they're great. And they were totally on our team and down to make the movie that we wanted to make. But every story that I've heard where you're working with giant actors, we were lucky. Um, every time I've heard stories about working with giant, giant actors, they read the script, they say, yes, they're gonna do it. And then the day comes and they have to say the funny line or, or the offensive thing. And they say, I actually got a couple ideas of how this scene can change. And then you have to pivot based on ego sometimes. And so the movie ends up getting watered down and becoming a little bit more mediocre and a little bit safer because their manager told them in the trailer that this could go bad because of a deal that they have in China. There's like a thousand different ways to make a mediocre movie and a bunch of different filters that the movie has to go through before um, it gets its teeth cut off. Uh, but I think really by not having big actors, you know, you can make really subversive genre films. Like my last two films were genre films and we were able to get away with some pretty insane stuff because that sells overseas. You know, you don't need subtitles for an explosion. It, you know, you can sell the rights to um, different territories because it's a slasher film and like that, it doesn't need to have big actors in it. It's actually helpful if it doesn't. Um, so I prefer to play in this sandbox because you're able to show the full breadth of the First Amendment in America. You can show real cursing, <laughs> you can show real sex, you can show real violence in a way that movies with shareholders and brands to protect like movie stars, um, you can't really do that kind of stuff. That's mm. why that's why Robert Pattinson being in good time was so incredible because you can make a movie that is insane uh, that also has a huge star in it. And I think that'll probably be the next step for us, but we haven't been able to find our way to do it yet. Yeah, and obviously, like you mentioned, there's pros and cons to having these big stars in your movies. And you're talking about, you know, like creative direction. They might not want to say this particular thing and that might change the script or the feel of the scene, but were, did you have any experiences where you were on like set of your own film because you've acted in, in them as well, where you're like, you know what? I actually want to take this in a completely different direction than what I have written on paper. And does it feel like a gamble in that moment if you're making that decision on the fly? Of course. Um, you always show up to set and the location is not as big as you need it to be. Yeah. The, the, the crane won't fit in, the jib won't fit in, and so you have to pivot. And actually now it's a steady cam shot and seeing the creep it should be. Um, it's always stuff like that. That is just the, you know, um, you just have to barter with that stuff. That's just filmmaking. Um, but then there are times when you show up and the, somebody hasn't memorized the lines or didn't learn the, the lines in Italian or whatever is needed for the scene. And you kind of have to change the scene to not be this character's scene, but instead it's this other character's scene. Mm. And it's a lot of like going through rehearsal in the first few takes. And then it's just private conversations where you can't make a scene on set. You kind of have to like sneak away with different people and be like, this is not working. I, we need to find a way to make this work. How are we gonna do this? We only have three more hours in this location. Um, there's a good quote from David Fincher 
He said, uh, you don't know what directing is until you have five shots left to get, but the sun is going down and you're only going to get two. Mm-hmm. And I think that that is so profound across the boards where like that really is um, directing. You always end up getting to that compromise position and you just have to find the best way to be a diplomat and not be hated after making a movie. But how do you play that fine line? Because oh, I'm bad at it. I'm really bad at it. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm really bad at it. Like I, the, the way that I've been able to get my way has been incredibly subversive of like, I have to make, I'm an influencer as well, quote unquote, of like, you know, I make these behind the scenes documentaries showing the next generation how we were able to do it because it's of interest. Um, but that becomes a threat almost where like, if someone is not doing what they need to do, if they're not doing their job, the threat of it being in the documentary is always present. And so right. like, really that becomes leverage for us of like, you know, it, it, it's so important, you know, b- bad stuff, what is it, they say democracy dies in darkness, uh, where like, if you can just shine a light on something, immediately people start doing their jobs and, uh, and, and being much more altruistic to, to the film. So I don't know, I, I'm really bad at it. I'm, I didn't get into film for politicking. I, gave, I got <laughs> into film to make good movies and those two don't often align. Yeah, and I think, you know, in, in these situations, people probably have to take situations with a grain of salt. No, it's nothing personal. This is just, we got a timeline, we got to move <laughs> and yeah. just move on through that. Um, yeah. I, I kind of want to hop back to this whole idea of Hollywood because I think a lot of times people are like, that's the way to go. That's how we're going to become successful. But um, in, in your experience, your opinion, what are some of the biggest misconceptions people maybe have about the success projects might find when they're backed by Hollywood studios? Um, so many of them are sanitized. There are really great uh, executives at A24 and Neon and IFC um, who are pushing the boundaries and making stuff that is actually good and not mm-hmm. just you know, mediocre comedies or mediocre horror or whatever. They actually, you know, these are perverts that run the companies, um, which is a good thing. So I think the, the big misconception is that anybody cares about scripts at all. That's the biggest one that I've noticed is that someone thinks that they're going to write a screenplay and they're going to spend a whole bunch of time making it better and making it perfect and making it perfect. And they keep making it more perfect. And then by the end of it, they're four years into writing this thing and still nobody cares. And To give you a shorthand, I wrote my second film, The Wolf of Snow Hollow, uh, a year before I wrote the Thunder Road feature. And we sent it out to a couple of different companies and they all said, no, we can't see it. Thank you so much. And then I wrote Thunder Road and it won the grand jury prize at South by Southwest. And that next week I had responses on the same email chain saying, no, this werewolf movie isn't that great. Saying, hey, what's going on with this werewolf movie? We'd love to, we'd love to do it. And we got the film greenlit, I think in the next few weeks and had nothing to do with the quality of the script. I had to Mm -hmm. go away for six weeks to make the script better um, because we actually got it greenlit. Like the vast majority of movies in Hollywood get greenlit, not based on the script, but based on the package of some actor coming aboard and, I think that sometimes um, approaching film as a screenwriter can be a lot of wasted time daydreaming and buying scratch tickets rather than actually making something that could make you a better candidate or make your future scripts more valuable. I think that might be a hard reality to face though. Yep. It's a daydreaming, it but is. it's like, you know, that's your heart and your soul, that script that you're sending to everybody and you're constantly facing rejection. That's like a part of you, I imagine, right? Oh, it's, and, awful. it's awful. And, and, and it's, yeah. a, it's a really brutal thing to face, but you have to face it. No one is going to help you. No one is going to care about your writing. Um, nobody reads anymore. Like I've had to turn all of my scripts into podcasts to get an executive to, to listen to it, which is fine. We're, we're good at it. But never daydream that anybody's going to come along because you're brilliant and give you a bunch of money. That doesn't happen. It just doesn't. Like, it just doesn't. Chloe Zhao's father is a billionaire. 
Like the vast majority of these people who get their first big movie off of the ground, it never comes because of the quality of their writing. It's always because of these different things that they're able to put together. It's them making movies first. Like you kind of have to prove yourself as a candidate for people's attention before they'll ever read anything and take it seriously. One of the main things that I think I've been taking away from this conversation is pivoting. Pivoting is so crucial and so important. And in today's landscape, how important is it to be, I guess, a multifaceted filmmaker? Like, is it a necessity to have skills that kind of fall outside this traditional scope of filmmaking? Like, for example, being able to edit your own films. Yep. Yeah. Um, yes, it's incredibly important. Uh, Editing, I think, is the only, my education in editing is the only reason why uh, my movies are any good. We'll do single take short films where it's all one shot, but had I not spent 10 years being an editor, I wouldn't have known how long the gaps should be between conversations, between things coming into frame. Um, it's incredibly important. And teaching editing is also incredibly important to see how a scene can change just by moving heads and tails on stuff. We run a lab every year called the Short to Feature Lab uh, where we bring in short filmmakers and help them develop their shorts and features, all pro bono, all philanthropic, but we try to have at least one editing session where people who are not editors of their shorts or their features can learn how these things get put together. It's very, very valuable and very important. Um, and then when it comes to like financing and understanding how startups are built, you kind of have to have a business knowledge as well. That's something that we learned and built the plane while we were flying it. I'm just like, all right, we have to figure this stuff out. Um, that's very valuable. Having a good legal sense to make sure that you're not getting screwed out of money in a contract is very important, um, or at least having good resources for that is very important. Um, knowing everything on set, David Fincher worked basically every position on a film set before he started directing. And that just made his directing so much better because he could look at someone setting up a light and go, cool, that's gonna take 15 minutes because I've done that myself. I now have 15 minutes to talk to the actors before we got the next shot going. And mm -hmm that times a million for me of like, we're in this location, let's get a quick, cool, slow-mo dolly shot because I might be able to use them for Facebook ads 10 months from now, once the movie is done as like ancillary marketing materials. All of that stuff is, is so crucial when it comes to filmmaking. It's just presence of mind. It's interesting that you mentioned that because you're not only thinking about making a movie, you're thinking about marketing because <laughs> marketing yeah. is, just a, a, like a massive part of it. So what has your experience been like marketing these short independent films? With shorts, um, we've been lucky. With shorts, Vimeo uh, has been very kind to us in the past and staff picked us kind of randomly of like, Thunder Road was the first one because they were doing a new program called Staff Picks Premiere, or Staff Picks Premiere, yeah, Staff Picks Premiere. And we were the first one in that. So that took a bit of infrastructure, but then sometimes we'll post something and they'll staff pick it. And it's nice, they've been putting the spotlight on us as filmmakers. Um, but really, I haven't really had any success on Vimeo or sorry, on, on YouTube or Facebook or anything like that. I've never really made the stuff that does well on those platforms. Um, but with features, we've done, you know, a huge amount of advertising for our films. We've done uh, Facebook ad campaigns, like for, for Thunder Road, it's really like an interracial buddy cop comedy, as well as like a family kitchen sink drama um, <laughs> about death, about, you know, the opioid crisis in America. So it's, you know, ball, the basket of laughs. Um, but we targeted uh, adults who like Pixar, because there's a lot of cursing in Thunder Road, because people go to Pixar movies to laugh and cry at the same time. And we thought, well, they're probably adults who like this kind of stuff. Let's let's see if we can target them. And then we also targeted people who liked Training Day and um, you know Law and Order and that kind of stuff. Uh, and it ended up doing well. Basically, for every dollar we put into Facebook ads, we got five in return. So oh, wow. it was just this kind of psychographic thinking and marketing that we just we listened to the audience. People would come out of the movie theater and tell us what was valuable to them and important to them and we listened. It's, mm -hmm. it's, we knew our audience, that was the important thing. That's the most important thing is the audience as well as listening to them and okay, yeah, this is a good takeaway. This is how we progress and make things that will attract them again. 
especially anonymously, that's very valuable. People sometimes oh. have test screenings and they'll say, so what do you think of the movie? And they're just looking for compliments. And even if they say, hey, give, give us the negative stuff. When it's, when it's person to person, people tend to be much more couching their language. Whereas if it's anonymous, they can say this scene sucked. And like, you yeah. need to cut this character, this actor sucks. And like <laughs> that kind of response is so much more valuable than the pleasantries of, you know, having a screening and talking about how brilliant you are. Yeah, actually, can I, I want to share a story about that because yeah, sure. I, at one point in my career, I was doing a lot of junkets in LA. Like I'd go and, and interview like, um, you know, the stars of the movies and they'd ask for quotes like, oh, can you write a quote for us? And there was one movie I particularly didn't like, but I wrote something great because the person was right there. And then like a couple months later, I get a picture sent to me because my quote was on the back of the DVD when they were selling it. Yeah. And I was like, oh, I wasn't really honest, but hey, my quote's on the back of the DVD. Yeah, um, yeah it's an interesting thing that anonymously is like the right way or like, you know, the most effective way of doing these things. Yeah. Yeah, it's a really dangerous thing too. That marketplace of like, especially with like bigger outlets, it's very scary where they'll like, you know, these giant corporations will pay millions of dollars to have these specialty, you know, critic screenings and stuff. And I'm really glad when the critics are honest, when they're like, yeah, no, I knew they were trying to pull the wool over my eyes by giving me this gift basket. I know what's going on here. You know, it's like, but it's scary. It's a dangerous thing. It's like, it, it, it hurts the public a bit because we are convoluting our diet of what is good movies and encouraging the next generation to look up to these movies as if they're good yeah. and they're not. And that can, that can, you know, distract and derail the next generation of kids who are looking at these movies and thinking, oh, this is how you become a serious filmmaker is by making crap like this. And it's yeah. not true. <laughs> yeah, honesty is the best policy. I learned that from that moment on. <laughs> honesty, honesty, it's very important. Yeah. And um, you you mentioned before, this is one of the other questions we were talking about, is editing. Like, you know, you kind of already had your foot in that, you knew what you were doing, and especially for Thunder Road, like those one-shot scenes, like you, you already knew how to map those out. Um, but because you have knowledge in editing, do you find that it's actually more difficult for you to hand off all your footage and tell someone, hey, edit this, because they might not be as passionate about it as, as you are, like the final outcome? And if so, does that then become a potential problem with not being able to be hands off, being involved in every single step? And how do you strike a balance if that's the case? Um, two things there. The first one uh, is about my own uh, ego when it comes to editing something that I'm acting in. And most mm -hmm. people would say, oh, I'd hate that. But really, I'm the person who's going to care the most about it. It's the equivalent of like giving someone the ability to edit photographs of you and put them on Instagram. It's like, yeah, no, I'd rather, yeah. I'd rather do that. Thank you very much. Um, <laughs> and so if you know how to do it, then, then do it. You know how you think you're going to look best. Sometimes you don't. But my movies are so humiliating on purpose that I lean into that. And it's very fun. You know, I get to play a clown in some of these movies, and it's really fun. Um, but then the second one is something that is dangerous that I think is an important thing for kids to hear, that if you do have an idea of how the movie should be done, because of the power dynamics of you being a writer and director and actor or just a director, people will say you're too controlling or like you need to be able to relieve some of this work to other people whose job it is. And you'll get that from many different sources, significant others, you'll get that from, you know, higher members of the crew, um, you know, different, you know, department heads and things. And that sounds really good as an argument. It's actually a power play. It's people saying, I think, or other people will know better than you do. And they're, they're leaning into your inadequacy traps um, and doing that to coerce you to do something that might make their life easier. But the, the problem with that is with a piece of artwork, when you put more time and attention and work into it, it can become more perfect. And so if it was something else, if it was a different walk of life, it was parenting. Sometimes when you're over controlling a parenting, you end up having a negative effect. But with a piece of artwork, it actually does make the movie better if you spend 25 hours working on the sound design uh, to make it perfect before it goes out the door, because it's going to live on the internet forever with your name on it. So I would say, do not listen to those people when they say it's okay for you to phone it in. Mm -hmm. So like, you know, put your head down and just get in those hours. Because I imagine though, does it become overbearing at some point? And you're like, oh my oh, gosh, sure. like I need to oh, relax sure. for a sec. 
Oh, sure. Uh, we, yeah. we, we finished production on Thunder Road, uh, the feature on November 20th, 2017. And we screened it on March 6th, uh, 2018 in Austin, Texas, in South by Southwest. Mm -hmm. It had its world premiere. And a lot of those months in between, it was me sleeping in the loft office that we had at Vanishing Angle to make sure that it got done. There were times when there were boom poles that entered frame and I had to learn after effects to cut it out. It's all brutal. It's all terrible. There's a good quote from um, one of the lead uh, animators on Who Framed Roger Rabbit where Robert Zemeckis said, can we do this cool thing where we bump the lamp in this one scene and the lamp is spinning around the room uh, and and we'll have like Roger animated and we'll see his shadow going against the wall just like all the other characters. Can we do that? Uh, and he said, yeah, we can do that. And he said, will it be harder? And he goes, yeah, it'll be five times harder. <laughs> he goes, of course, I've never seen that before. I've never seen that on film before in, in an animation. Um, and ever since Disney called that bumping the lamp. And it's incredibly important that when you're making stuff like this, you do ed as much work as you possibly can to bump the lamp because you've got to impress people. It has to be something that stands out and you're not making stuff to blend in. You're not making mm -hmm. something just to make a movie. Who cares? Mm -hmm. You have to you have to do something very impressive and you'll know what that means. And I think that adds on to the conversation we had about being a multifaceted filmmaker. That example that you said of like a boom in the shot, you then had to learn after effects yourself yeah. to fix a problem. It wasn't like, hey, I'm gonna hand this off and let somebody else deal with it, right? You and didn't have any money. There was, there was and, no, there was, and, and also it, it, so every time that I've been, that I've handed something off to someone, they do the, they do the least amount of work possible to get it to be the thing. And then they give it off to you because they're trying to get you off of their plate as a client. They're mm -hmm. on this like small leash of money to you to do the thing and phone it in. And you don't have that, you know, it has to be perfect. And so if it means that you have to watch a couple of YouTube tutorials and stay up a little later, um, so be it. The movie has to be perfect. Yeah. And you're just building your skill set as you go along and you do all those things. And again, I think that it's important to note that this industry, you know, you have to face so many challenges to get to where even where you are today. And do you find from your experience in the industry that it's been common for filmmakers to make like excuses as to why they're not successful and like why they can't make a film? And if oh, you have oh, heard like, what are the common excuses you've heard and what would your rebuttal be to those excuses? Um, yeah, I'm bad with that. Uh, you know, the number one thing when I say go make a movie with your friends, sometimes people will just take a picture of an empty wallet that's open. And they're like, oh. you know, <laughs> as a response, they're just like, yeah, but where's the money? How do you do yeah. it? Um, to which one of my biggest detractors on Twitter was a very nice filmmaker. And she had her pinned tweet for a while saying like, uh, you know, but what about the money? And it was like making fun of me. And mm -hmm. um, I didn't realize it, but she celebrated it being up for a year. And she was like, oh, this thing. So I, I got my attention. I messaged her and said, um, I'll help you raise the funds on WeFunder. We did a great job with our, you know, campaign. To, and it's like, it's like a Kickstarter campaign, except it's crowd equity. And um, and I said, like, I'm happy to help. I do this for all of our short to feature lab fellows. I want everybody to be able to make their movies. And it kind of fell through. She ended up not doing it. And I, I know that feeling. It's terrifying to, to take out money, to take out a loan, to go and do something, as it is with every startup. Anytime you're going to open a bakery or any small business, you need to take out a loan from a bank or from high net worth individuals that are going to invest in you. Um, and it's brutal and it's terrifying. But for us, that or those early investments were the reason why any of the movies were very good because I was anxious the whole time and that anxiety made the movies better. Um, you know, I don't blame people. Some people have five children after they graduate college mm -hmm. and it's like, you know, you, you, your time is taken doing that. And the, day, the dream is still there that you want to keep making stuff. I think really in the future, everything is going to become democratized. The technology will be there now where you can shoot something with your iPhone and you know, have it play on the world stage. These cameras are getting less expensive. Access to this technology to edit something from a laptop. I edited and mixed our last feature film in the room I'm talking to you in, and it didn't look like this. It was much uglier. <laughs> now I cleaned it up, I painted the walls and stuff. Um, but 
it, you can do that now. And I think it's only going to be easier. You'll be able to have a film studio from your cell phone in 30 years. And um, you just have to memorize stuff. You have to learn the, you have to educate yourself in the craftsmanship of cinema, learn the language of cinema. And that's what will set you apart. But, um, you know, it's only going to get easier to make movies and it's only going to get easier to make movies with your friends. I think another thing is fear of rejection might be a big thing is you might not be putting yourself out there enough because you're afraid of the nose that you'll have to face because like you said, it hurts. It's brutal in those moments, yeah. right? But I think it's just something that people have to face along the journey, right? I was perfectly primed. Um, my wife left me in 2014 and I oh, had no. just, no, it's fine. It's oh. fine. Um, <laughs> Uh, I've gotten over it, but, um, but I got a book called about fear of rejection. And the way that you can get over that is by walking up to strangers in the street and asking if they have a cigarette or if you can get a ride <laughs> somewhere. And it's amazing to say like, Hey, you might, can I get a ride to Culver city? And they're all like, no, what are you talking about? Especially during COVID. It's, it's kind of funny, but I used to do it all the time. And to have that rejection therapy of someone looking you in the face and going, absolutely not, are you stupid? Um, <laughs> is such a great, just ask for gum and, and like anything just to have, just to have them go, no, and it's uncomfortable. It's, it's amazing the calluses that you can build up and that's normal. That's like, you know, most New Yorkers are probably used to that kind of stuff. And so when you walk into a business meeting and ask for a bunch of money, it's easier for a New Yorker than it is for someone from New Orleans who is this aw shucks guy. I needed that. Uh, to, to do the thing. So yeah, I don't, I, I think really that fear of rejection is something that lives inside of your mind that you have to cure. So would you recommend to anybody watching this right now is oh, yeah. ask strangers for gum? Oh yeah, there? ask for a ride and see if they'll give it to you because almost every time they'll say no. Um, and then if they if they start to, this is one of my buddy Dustin's, I can't take credit for this one, but say, hey, can I get a ride to Culver City? And if they say yes, you go, oh, okay, cool. Uh, who'd you guys end up voting for? <laughs> and then and then see what they say because if you come across as a trumper then they're like oh absolutely i'm not giving you a ride and that's always fun to do in a metropolis wow all these tips and tricks are learning. i think we have time for two more questions um so looking back at all of the films you've worked on if yeah. you actually got the opportunity to go back in time in a time machine and change something in any one of your movies would you change anything? And if yes, what would it be? Oh man. I mean, there are things, there's like the George Lucas in me where I look back and after learning After Effects, I'm like, oh, I could have stabilized that shot better. Um, but that's just how you should always feel when you look back at your old movies. They should be works in progress. They should be, mm -hmm. not that I would ever touch them and destroy them again or make them you know, cleaner or anything, but you know, if you're a filmmaker, you progress, you make something and it's not as good as the next ones. Hopefully that's how it should be. Um, so there's small things like that, but no, I'm very proud of the stuff that we did. There's a million little things of like, oh, we didn't get that to work and that could have been cool. Or like, I wish they, I wish the studio had let me put that one line in because that would have been truer to alcoholism, I think, um, but it was a bit coarse. So I don't know, I, I, there, there's little things like that, but you know, that's normal. I'm very happy that the movies are the way that they are. Yeah. And I think it's, again, a, a, a over critical eye sometimes is like when you're looking at your own, your own films, your own products, you're like, oh, you know, like, I wonder if anybody in the audience caught that and might not yeah. have, but to you, it's like, oh, I just wish that I could have yep. fixed that. Right. Yep. Yep. There's a couple and of moments like that. There's one moment that's a very important shot in my last film, the beta test. And the LUT, the like coloring uh, layer slipped when I delivered it to the studio. And it drives me nuts. And it, it went out in France where it was fixed. And I think it went out somewhere else where it was fixed. So it's like, I don't feel so bad, but when it, I think it's on Hulu, there's like this one small LUT slip and it's like, man, I really wish somebody had caught that. And yeah. uh, it should have been me. That's okay. Don't be too hard on yourself. You caught it after <laughs> the fact, at least you know for the next time, that's what you yeah. gotta look out for. Yeah. <laughs> So for, for you, what are some of the key takeaways you've learned in making the jump from shorts to features? Um, I always say, if you're going to make your first feature, make a feature first. Uh, that's always important. Learning how to tell a story over 90 minutes is very different um, than writing a bunch of scenes and then cutting them together as if they're a bunch of short films. That's not a feature. It can mm -hmm. be. 
Slacker is like that. A um, bunch of movies are like that. But um, to tell a story over a 90 minute or two hour period is very different than telling a story over 11 minutes or you know 15 minutes. Um, so I would say do as much as you can to make something that's 90 minutes long to learn how you can carry an audience's attention for that time period. Yeah, and it's again that time frame it's jumping from 11 minutes to 90 minutes. I guess at first it might be like this is incredibly intimidating, but you know, as you have all those skill sets, it might become easier over time. So, Jim, I think that's all the time that we have for today. Thank you so much for this. Thank you for being open and honest. I think you gave some really solid advice and gave some really good insight into your personal experience. So, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. It was my pleasure. Yeah, and this conversation along with a full list of our industry program and film schedule are available to view on fofs.ca and the official selection is streaming on CBC Gem. So everyone to watch, thank you so much for joining us and I guess see you next year. Maybe I'll see you next year or somebody else will be here. But anyways, bye. <laughs>